Ian has a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Electromechanical Engineering from the University of Southampton and a Master of Science degree in Marine Engineering from the University College London. He began his career with 21 years in the Royal Navy, followed by a year with Fraser Nash Consultancy and three years with Babcock International. He has been with Naval Ship Management Australia, NSM, for two and a half years now. Ian is currently the head of engineering at NSM and is responsible for growing the engineering and asset management capability and capacity within NSM. He works across all of NSM's programs to provide technical leadership and expertise. Ian is a chartered engineer with over 25 years experience in maritime platforms and is the current committee member and PRI assessor for the Western Australian branch of RMRS. Now I will hand over to our presenter, Ian. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Simon. And uh, first and foremost, thanks very much uh, for the introductions. And I'd like to thank uh, IMRS and Rena for this opportunity to present. Okay, so over the next sort of 30 minutes or so, I'll guide you through a presentation on inclusive approach to naval sustainment from naval ship management. Uh, I'll make some apologies. I have got a couple of dogs at home. Um, I'm dog sitting, uh, unfortunately, the wife's working. Uh, if you've got any questions, please raise them and I'll try and um, address them as I go through, or if not, uh, I've allowed plenty of time uh, towards the end. If you see me flicking to my left, that's just because the, the slide pack's uh, there on my screen. Okay, so a little bit back to this evening's agenda. So the presentation is going to articulate uh, the four key building blocks that underpin NSM strategy. I'll include some case studies and hopefully put some of the, the theory into practice. And then, like I said, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. Uh, I will play a couple of videos, so hopefully the audio will come through. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to be a, a difficult two minutes just as you watch it, each one of those uh, as we soldier through. Okay, first, a, a little bit about me. Um, so for those that are in the cycle community and have uh, endured COVID over the last sort of 12 months, this is Swift. Um, that's my virtual sort of avatar that keeps me sane during the week. Um, I'm keen to do a bit of cycling outdoors when I can, whether that's road uh, or mountain biking. And, and then a couple of times during the week, I like to keep up the training. As Simon alluded to, I've been with NSM and uh, the wider Babcock team since 2012. Uh, I became head of engineering in 2018. Uh, I was born in the UK, as the accent might give that away, uh, in Torquay, and I currently live in south, uh, well, south of Perth uh, in a place called Secret Harbour. Um, the secret, there's no harbour uh, for those that know WA. Uh, I'm a proud father of two, her eldest being Sam, who's 21, who's now joined the, the Royal Australian Navy, and my daughter Grace, who's just about to live school, and I've been married for oh, uh, about 22 years. That's probably enough about me. A little bit of context then, so what's NSM? Um, we're a leading provider of complete maritime sustainment solutions. What does that really mean? So our team of sustainment experts, strategically located across Australia, work with our broad Australian and international supply chain to provide cost-effective and responsive solutions that optimise the availability, capability and seaworthiness of critical maritime assets. As you can read there, um, we were established in 2012 as a joint venture between Babcock Pty and UGL Limited. We now support assets across the Royal Australian Navy's fleet. Our capability spans the full spectrum of naval sustainment services, whether that's asset management, ship repair, refit and refurbishment, maintenance support, engineering support, supply chain management, and procurement and logistics support. Our presence, so we're headquartered in Henderson, and that's where I work in WA. However, we do have a national footprint that's uh, highly responsive, uh, you know, with our evolved supply chain, and we continue to evolve as the future maritime sustainment model uh, moves out to support, to support customers' critical assets wherever and wherever uh, they, they may need and where that arise. 
We've got two primary contracts at the moment. Uh, so we provide long-term systemic contracts for the Royal Australian Navy, uh, most notably, and the first one is the Anzac class frigates as a member of the Warship Asset Management Agreement, commonly known as the WAMA. So awarded in 2016, the WAMA represents an alliance with NSM, BAE Systems, Saab and the Commonwealth with a total asset management of the asset class or the Anzac class frigates through to the end of their life. So together, the WAMA Alliance delivers materially seaworthy warships, driving long-term efficiencies for the Royal Australian Navy. And our second contract, as the LHD Asset Class Prime Contractor, or ACPC, NSM provides the support and sustainment program for two Canberra-class landing helicopter docks, LHDs, HMA Ships Canberra and Adelaide, and the 12 LHD landing craft, so that the ACPC contract includes the through life support facility and the Navy Training Systems Centre based at Randwick Barracks in New South Wales. So what are our key building blocks? So there's four key building, key building blocks that underpins our strategy. So naval sustainment and support is built upon the inclusive prime model an evolution of our successful thin prime model that provided industry with opportunities to contribute to naval sustainment and develop their capability. Rather than simply integrating industry, incorporates four key building blocks to deliver effective and efficient naval services. So the first one of those is the right partnerships. So where they establish the right partnerships with shipbuilders, system manufacturers, manufacturers industry, and of course, the Navy. So not necessarily in any particular order, however, uh, the customer, uh, most notably the Department of Defence and in conjunction with the Navy, the end user. So I have a number of selected partners, uh, members of enterprises or members of the alliance. Um, so whilst not necessarily exhaustive, these are some of the, those companies that we deal with. So left to right, BA Systems and Saab who are part of the, the WAMA Alliance, uh, Navantia, L3 and Siemens uh, contribute to the ACPC. And then supporting all the, the maintenance activities that we do, our, our supply chain, our repair agents, our technical support network, those people that actually do the, the blue collar work and some of those sort of smart thinking that brings, uh, I suppose, all of our maintenance services to there. So just as an example of this, um, what I'd like to do is just give you uh, an example for our transformational partnership. So a little bit of context then that the situation, HMS Adelaide and HMS Canberra were required to be recalled from the reduced activity period or RAP at short notice. They were needed for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, um, commonly known as HADAR, during HMS Shores and MV Sigmore already deployed in support of the newly declared Operation Bushfire Assist. Before her deployment, HMS Adelaide required a number of outstanding maintenance activities to be performed that were identified after a last overseas deployment late in 2019. HMS Canberra was also in a wrap and undergoing continuous maintenance with multiple systems requiring reactivation and certification before she could be deployed. So what was our solution? In addition to logistics, NSM arranged a number of contractors to accelerate scheduled maintenance activities to support this mission. Specifically, the gas turbine, which was scheduled for maintenance in January, was performed before the Christmas thanks to the responsiveness of the GE team. Following HMS Adelaide's deployment, HMS Canberra also required preventive and corrective maintenance across the critical systems to be completed by NSM and our repair agents, ranging from flight deck systems, surveillance systems, cranes and davits, and propulsion systems. So what was the outcome? HMS Adelaide was reactivated earlier than expected, less than 48 hours of being notified of the requirements to support the deployment for Operation Bushfire Assist as directed by the Commonwealth of Australia. NSM arranged contractor G Marine to sail with HMS Adelaide and remain on board to facilitate final set to work of the gas turbine system. Shadboat, another one of NSM's major partners, 
also sailed with HMS Adelaide to provide fitting and set to work of mechanical systems. HMS Canberra was also made available on time within three weeks of notification after undergoing her maintenance. Notable achievements across both platforms included rectification of over 40 high priority defects along the conduct of preventive and corrective maintenance to critical systems including propulsion and fire main and fixed firefighting systems. Our second key building block is Australianised supply chain. Our support for Australian small businesses and their engagement in the sustainment and support of Australia's naval assets is often what we're most associated with. We recognise that Australian industry capability development is more than a simple headline number on supply chain participation. We support this development through providing supplies assurance, stability and an environment that encourages investment, training systems, equipment and facilities. Facilitating engagement with CDIC and access to Commonwealth Development Grants. So CDIC is a centre of defence industry capability and identifying and supporting specific capability development opportunities for Australian SMEs. So how does this translate into action? As an example, NSM conducted preliminary investigations to alternative coatings within the Australian SME Echo Yachts. This work identified the Tefroka deck coating system developed by GTF 33s from Germany as the preferred product Tefroka is a self-leveling mortar polymer system that seals the deck. It's jointless, hard wearing, abrasion resistant, watertight and IMO approved. Application of the product requires suitably trained and competent personnel. NSM worked with the Commonwealth, GTF Freeze and, and Echo Yachts with match funding from Sovereign Industry Capability Priority Grant. And what we managed to do was deliver a proof of concept, um, which was applied on HMS Ballarat. Upskill Echoes Yacht staff to a secure OEM approval for the company for the application of the Tefroka coating system. So following the proof of concept, Tefroka was approved for use across the ANZAC class with more than 420 square metres laid in 2020 across five platforms. Our third key building block is effective collaborative relationships. In a complex alliance or enterprise, the provision of seaworthy material requires strong collaboration across all participants. Furthermore, the dynamic nature of naval sustainment requires a level of responsiveness that can only be achieved through effective collaboration. Without effective collaboration, there is a danger that accountabilities and requirements can be interpreted in isolation. So NSM is aligned to ISO 44001, which is the Collaborative Business Relationship Management System, because of three reasons. Provides a clear framework for collaboration that enables specific strategies to be established, supported by a common set of table resources defined in the standard. Secondly, recognises the role of individuals and supports the development of individual competencies as well as organisational development. And thirdly, Babcock, one of NSM's joint venture partners, is a founding member and ambassador of the Institute for Collaborative Working, the sponsors of the ISO 44001 standard, and supported benefits of aligning with the standard. So ISO 44001 is built around a collaboration life cycle of eight stages. The earlier stages are primarily focused on internal alignment with the benefits of business collaboration, whereas the latter stages are related to the mechanics of actual collaboration with your partners. The application of the standard in NSM's context is primarily focused on the three stages of working together by the governance management systems and processes. Value creation, the continuous improvement process, and staying together, team management, monitoring, measurement, and behavior. 
A recent paper on defence industry collaboration highlighted three critical elements for this collaboration. First one is core values and culture. As with other enterprises established in support of the RAND's fleet, sitting above how we and all enterprise participants will work together is the enterprise charter. Secondly, uh, communication. It's important to create the psychologically safe environment for communication. Psychological safety is a belief that one can openly speak with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes, but more importantly, without fear. Research by Google and the Harvard Business School has highlighted it as having the largest impact on teams' success. Fostering psychological requires leading by example, so leaders within the team will be open to opinions, approachable and encouraging of questions, and will acknowledge their mistakes. Secondly, encouraging active listening by, for example, showing understanding by repeating what's been said or communicated and discourage phones in meeting rooms. Thirdly, creating a safe environment by ensuring people aren't interrupted, not placing blame and not being judgmental of ideas. And the fourth and final one in that concept is developing an open mindset by encouraging the sharing of feedback. And the third one, just to com complete that Venn diagram, is trust. Trust is nurtured through working in accordance with the processes, principles and responsibilities set out in the management plans. However, the measurement of trust is more challenging, in part because of the broad range of potential trust indicators based on performance, communications, honesty, and problem resolution. An example is to identify a small set of trust indicators for collaboration. In the past, we've used prompt responses to queries, openness and transparent communications, and declaring lack of capability and resource. I'd like to move on to uh, another case study just to try and articulate some of those areas. Okay, so the more astute of you will know that was a, an ANZAC class frigate, and um, I have flipped the, the picture in this instance. Um, so it is 153 for those that uh, are eagle eyed uh, with pennant numbers. So the aft stern's tube seal. So the current repair procedure to change out the aft stern tube seal is to dry dock the ship. Docking facilities are located on both the west and east coast of Australia. Once docked, the stern tube is drained, the stern tube seals removed and replaced, and on completion, the stern tube is refilled and the ship is undocked and returned to the water. Through advances in technology, Wartzilla were able to offer an in-water repair option to replace the aft stern tube seal without the need for dry docking. This involved training the stern. This involved draining the stern tube of oil and erecting a hyperbaric changer chamber or a habitat on the shaft line. As you can make out on the, the right um, photograph there, slightly blurry, uh, that's the habitat in situ. Then on the one on the left is the, the diver in, inside. So once the habitat is in place, the seal assembly would be removed, cleaned and refurbished. On completion, the stern tube is refilled with oil and the habitat removed. So working collaboratively, this um, I suppose, increased uh, availability of, of the ship uh, and drove the, the total cost of ownership then. So what you can see for, with, with acknowledgement through Wartzilla and ICAD engineering is actually um, collaboration coming together to deliver, to deliver on behalf of the Royal Australian Navy. Okay, the, the fourth key building block um, easily said, but hard to, to implement, and that's robust digitally enabled asset management. From our view, asset management is like the keel block of naval sustainment. It provides a solid platform 
for the effective delivery of all the associated services that work together to maintain ship availability, capability and seaworthiness. NSM's asset management capability focuses on balancing costs, opportunities and risks against the desired asset performance through the naval vessel life cycle. So it's founded on one processes, processes that are aligned to ISO 55001 for the standard for complex and critical equipment and tailored to the needs of all stakeholders. People, people who provide the know-how and the know-why required to develop an effective long-term asset management strategy. Competencies, our ability to apply knowledge and skills to achieve intended results. And technologies, so technologies with a particular focus on the know what to deliver a single, accurate and complete source of truth for the delivery of asset management services. This ensures that asset management decisions and planning are not compromised by poor knowledge of the ships and their systems. Implementing a digitally enabled asset management approach that combines ISO standards with industry 4.0 technologies such as big data analysis and predictive modeling. So in November 2019, NSM was formally awarded certification of its asset management system with provision of sustainment services for maritime assets. Um, so we achieved ISO 55001 certification. What I'd like to do now is just run through a couple of examples um, where all of that has come to, together and to, to deliver favourable outcomes. So HMS uh, Arunta, Overseas Asset Management Planning and Support. In 2017, our team was instrumental to the planning and delivery of the first major fleet unit, extended maintenance period delivered overseas. For HMS Arunta in Bahrain, our planning strategy included bringing higher risk works forward for earlier maintenance periods and engaging with local industry. For HMS Canberra, the situation, we recently completed a five-year maintenance period for HMS Canberra. Uh, it's particularly complex. I suppose uh, the reason has been, at one, uh, the first five-year maintenance period. Um, it was the first delivered by the LHD Enterprise, comprising of the ACSPO, which is Amphibious Combat and Sea Lift System Program Office group or the amphibious assault ship group and ourselves NSM. It required effective collaboration with Navantia as the ship designer and major OEMs, particularly Siemens for the replacement of the propulsion pods. And to cap it all off, we completed it during the global COVID-19 pandemic. And what you see there is um, a couple of pods under wrapped prior uh, to the ship engine in the dock. I'll move through some of these pictures. There's probably about half a dozen in number, um, some better quality than other, um, just to give you that feel of what's going through. So what was the outcome from Canberra's first five year maintenance period? Well, the largest single achievement was the replacement of the 12 tonne pods that required an unprecedented level of engineering and local supply chain support for their transport, load and installation. For example, it required the following support structures to be designed and constructed locally. New A-frames and double beams to support the weights of the propellers and pods. A self-propelled modular transporter, which moves the pods and frames into position. New auxiliary cradles to support the bulk of propellers. And a 400 ton crawler crane to provide reach and lifting capabilities.
Follow lens, which is Google technology, was used to provide a link, a live link between the waterside crew and Siemens in Germany when specific technical support was required. Other highlights that show how these documents are so much more than these big ticket items include 190,000 hours of maintenance activity delivered by more than 50 Australian repair agents. A complete colour change of the LHD platform using more than 60,000 litres of paint. And the application of new underwater coating systems with DSCO, Defence Science Technology Organisation, to support anti firing trials. Simon, over to you. Thank you. Oh, uh, I have two questions loaded up at the moment. So the first question from Greg Hellesey is, with the participation of several companies in the maintenance activity, how does the Commonwealth determine the cost effectiveness of each activity? Uh, thanks very much for that uh, pointed question. So I'm just going to replay it back and one to, to give myself a bit of thinking time uh, and secondly to, to make sure that I've understood it. So how do we measure, I suppose, value for money for maintenance activities if we've got a number of repair agents? I think that's what I heard. Uh, please chip in if it wasn't. Um, so for each sort of task um, through our strategic procurement, um, we will either have, um, I suppose, three uh, identified sort of quotations and to deliver that um, body of work. You know, through strategic procurement, we can negotiate sort of different terms and, and conditions and try and provide that value for money uh, as well. Uh, and then conversely, um, whilst we're providing that sort of solution, is retrospectively looking back and, and making sure that our repair agents delivered against what they said that they were going to do. Uh, you know, so it's regular engagement with our supply chain, um, articulating the challenges. And then from the Conwell perspective, uh, is explaining to them where are those costs and we run an open and transparent sort of book on that site. So whilst we have pain share, we also have gain share. And one of those areas is making sure that we're transparent um, in all of our transactions. So hopefully that's um, addressed that question. In short, um, lots of communication, um, be open, be honest, uh, let the Conwell know what we're doing, trying to do and driver efficiencies through the process. The second question that was asked is, um, the stern tube servicing and shaft alignment is docking, independent, is docking dependent. However, shaft alignment should be achieved on water and not on dry, block, dry dock blocks to mimic service condition. Is there a plan to adapt Wartzilla and ICAD solution for all vessels, both in WAMA and ACPC? I don't know if there's a, a plan to adopt um, we've got different system program offices. Um, we like to think as the, the Commonwealth that all lead up to, to one area and we'll have a, uh, a single approach going across. Notably different ACPC and uh, WAMA, uh, one's podded and one's a shaft line. Um, I suppose that the wider sort of question is, would it be applicable to other shaft lines than the Australian Navy? Uh, unfortunately, we haven't got control over that, but what we can do is provide best practice back up through the system programs office. So whether that's the, the Naval Technical Bureau um, or the, the wider defence or stakeholders. Hmm. Thank you for that. And the next question, what is the division of responsibility between the ship's crew and the maintenance contractor? Um, we're all invested in together really. Um, so the, the ship's crew, they're the end users, they're, they're the, the people that operate and sort of do that uh, organic level maintenance. Uh, and through our asset performance and automation optimization teams or asset management teams, it's understanding their issues and how they're, they're being maintained. Um, you know, how do we receive that? That's through um, timely execution of maintenance reported on their, their management sort of planning system or apps in that instance. So it's incumbent on all of us. Uh, if we feel that uh, maintenance isn't being done correctly, um, whether that's through repair agent or ship staff, then it's engaging with the appropriate stakeholders. Uh, so it's like make, making sure that we've got a closed sort of feedback loop. So ship staff, you know, responsible for organic level maintenance as the 
the name would imply. And then for that uh, deeper level maintenance, um, that would be on ourselves then. But so it's working with, as opposed to opposing ship stuff. Aside from using the standard, can you please advise the other standards that NSM used in contracts and engage contractors? And did you use GC20 on or enable contract documents? Okay, probably out of my swim lane on that. No, I'm not an engineer as opposed to strategic procurement or supply chain, but I'll answer it best as I can. So we've got, um, I suppose, uh, the standards um, that's uh, universal uh, across, whether that's 9001, um, collaboration, uh, health, safety, and environmental. And the new one that we have got is our asset management system, but that's just uh, for the, the maritime assets of ACPC. So regards to other standards, uh, yeah, as relevant for uh, the, the particular contracts, and we'll flow that through our vendor management system of the the standards that it should be adhering to, you know. Um, so, as an example, um, classification society, whether that's DMV, GL, or Lloyd's, um, we do double in both those spaces. So, unfortunately, not a complete answer. Um, however, um, if you articulate that the full question to, to Simon, I'll get back to you with a more robust answer. Thank you. The next question. How is the quality assurance of all the different partners involved in a major event managed? Can you just repeat the question, the front bit of that question, please? Um, how is quality assurance managed when multiple partners are involved in the single activity? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So we've got our QA team, um, and I'm sure every uh, company, um, whether they've got QA or, or QC, um, may they do that independently or not. Uh, so we work in concert with uh, the Commonwealth and we do a joint sort of QA um, assurance uh, activities. Um, so one of those that we recently did, uh, Simon, I don't know if you're aware, um, through the ACPC was running through a number of our seaworthiness and engineering assurance uh, processes. Um, so looking at that cradle to grave and providing maintenance assurance uh, to the Commonwealth. So we didn't do that in isolation. Um, we worked with the, the Commonwealth to do a joint uh, QA activity. Um, that's not to end. And part of that is whether we were uh, opportunities for improvement, I don't know, uh, whether there's any non-conformities and what those appropriate actions and timeframes should be completed. So it's working through with the repair agents if they're doing welding, etc. There might be an inherent reliability of where that trust lies, so the responsibility might lie with them. Um, and then through our planning and project team, the, the OQE or the objective quality evidence that's submitted to support the, the work um, is that we can audit through on those. And that could be a paperwork exercise or it could be visiting the, the ship where the work has been conducted. And then ultimately, our deliverables that we give through uh, the system program office provides that governance and assurance role, uh, and they may choose then to, to order us through our processes and the OQE and the work that we have conducted. So it's multifaceted, um, but in essence, um, you know, all coming together and not hiding um, any bad news. You know, you know, if there is something there that needs to be addressed, uh, declare it um, openly, uh, but declare it swiftly as well. Thank you for that. The next question, uh, what are the biggest barriers to effective collaboration, communication and establishing psychological safety uh, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, this is just Ian Moon's opinion, okay, so not on behalf of NSM. Uh, I think it's that willingness to, to change um, and maybe we've all been in competition, uh, not necessarily for too long, and there's healthy competition there, isn't it? Um, but when we do work as uh, an alliance or an enterprise in one contract, we are alliance participants. And then in a, a future tender, uh, we could be seen as the, the opposition. Um, so it's having that trust to, to gain through that side. Um, so trust takes years uh, to build up and can be lost in um, a blink of an eye at moments of time. So if I haven't got a, a trust of the person that I'm working with um, or, or I'm reporting into, um, it's hard to, to maintain um, you know, that open dialogue. 
The next question, do you have components that are managed by stock item owners that are not part of the alliance? Uh, for example, uh, equipment that's being managed by other classes or other program support entities. And what is NSM's strategy for managing these external stock items? Okay, uh, we might be uh, venturing off of topic a, a little bit with some of those pointed questions, which we don't mind. Um, so, uh, government furnished equipment or contract furnished equipment, so that the stock items like, let's say, MCP or Maritime Cross Platform might own those items and responsible for delivery uh, on that side. It's given them fair notice um through the, the planning uh, and i think that's one of the the, the key words that we, we might not necessarily utilize or, or do um as, as thorough uh, as an enterprise or alliance so uh, yeah, i think we've all heard of whether it's the five p's or the, the seven p's but lots of planning beforehand and communication notification on that side uh, so it's working with the, the opposite numbers whoever's responsible for that stock item uh, now if it's becoming obsolete um, you know, we would like to, to find out uh, sooner rather than later. If there's an ensuring change or problem being reported, it's again um, communicating with that stock item owner to identify the, the shortcoming or how we can do business better. Mm -hmm. uh, I would leave it to the, the supply support team. You know, so as part of the authorised material seaworthiness delivery organisation, the AMS do, you know, it's incumbent on maintenance, supply support and engineering to work together to achieve uh, what the, the Navy or the, the Commonwealth would uh, The next question, what process does NSM have in place to foresee and de-risk any production overruns? Uh, we've got our planning process um, for all of our external maintenance periods, and then that's through a, a number of gates, so stage gates uh, approval. Uh, so working, uh, I suppose, as our schedulers uh, into production sort of delivery and that the program managers uh, presenting that information um, with months to run uh, of what that work list looks like and trying to, to lock that work list in as soon as possible and then resource appropriately against it with those predicted hours. Um, that's fine for corrective or known corrective maintenance that's planned in and likewise for preventive maintenance. Um, what is becoming challenging on aging assets is some of that growth work. You know, so uh, as an example, uh, many years ago uh, on HMS Manchester, I think it was uh, back in the UK, we had 40% growth uh, and that was probably through um, paint and preservation. No, so 25% of systemic costs is, 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 a, is as a direct result to corrosion. So it's trying to predict and at least have that uh, margin in there and that headroom. You know, so if we do encounter it uh, towards the, the back end of the schedule, um, whilst there might be unknown unknowns, uh, that they're not uh, in that sort of extent. So lots of planning, scheduling um, and on and so on. And uh, the next question, based on preventive maintenance scheduling, how do you identify the criticality of assets based on the suitable data in asset management system frequency of service? Yeah, this, at this point, I'd like to wheel in my asset performance and optimization manager. Uh, unfortunately, he's not uh, with me at the moment. His apology has been slightly flippant. Uh, it's looking at the system reviews and what's driving um, that criticality. Okay, so is it mission critical um, on that side or is it urgent? So urgent defects. So are there a number of corrective items that, that go through? Uh, oh. Uh, conversely, you know, what is the, the, the total cost of uh, maintaining that system? So what's the key driver? So understanding what the key driver is for that system um, in order to make it uh, available and capable when the, the customer wants it. So as an example, I think in the, the one when I, work, when I used to work there uh, a number of years ago, we'd do system reviews and we would do categorization through uh, corrective and preventive maintenance costs the number of air deaths, and then that the usage rates of some of the, the stores items and uh, the, I suppose that the cost of maintaining those stores items as well. And, and that 
then gave us that red, amber, sort of green from a health check of where we are with those systems. So, you know, if we can drive down the, the number of corrective maintenance activities um, and through asset optimization and asset performance in order to make sure that we've got the right preventive maintenance baseline. Next question. How does NSM support local Australian companies and plan ahead against obsolescence? Uh, do we? Uh, as much as we can do. Um, there's, there's many sort of uh, challenges with uh, the, the platforms and obsolescence. So obsolescence, um, whether that's technology, so making sure that we're capability relevant. So Anzac as a, a case example, um, you know, we might have a, a pump that goes uh, obsolete and it's the same fit form function, uh, easy enough uh, to do and find somewhere uh, within Australia to resource that appropriately. However, um, it, it may become obsolete because um, I suppose that the radio that we're communicating still works, but doesn't necessarily communicate with a wider fleet that's um, got a, an upgrade in technology. So it's working with the, the Commonwealth on that side to have a look at the capability assurance sort of programs and predicting what the, the, the fleet looks like. Um, how do we look to, to predict obsolescence? It's uh, actively engaging with some of those OEMs and technical support providers, supply chain management to say, you know, um, let us know when you come into the last of your stock um, or those items, um, you know, um, need to evolve over a period of time. Um, some of those um, areas, as a, an LHD example, so Navantia designed and built. Um, so there are a number of pieces of equipment that were supplied from Spain, and it's making sure that we can, you know, uh, have that organic um, and Australianised our supply chain over here uh, to replace them when, when they do go wrong, or um, we're looking to you know, the next mod up. And the next question on IP engineering is an important part of the design engineering design. How does NSM address this subject? Can you just repeat the front end of the question, please? Yeah, I think it was just asking um, how does NSM address uh, system safety engineering in the design? Uh, okay. Design? Right. So I've got uh, uh, Simon put him on the spot. Uh, <laughs> that Simon is NSM, um, particularly noting your background. How about that, Simon? Yeah, yeah. So um, NSM deals with system safety engineering by um, managing the LHD asset safety case. So there is a safety case which uh, provides assurance to the user that the product is safe to use from the operator's point of view. So whenever a change is implemented on board, we also go through all the system safety engineering um, standard the mil spec A82E and apply all the activities. And um, at the end of it, we met, we identify and track all the hazards and risks that have been pointed out, and we manage it until we can either close it off or we advise the the operator of the residual risk of operating the equipment. So um, we do track it and uh, we notify. The end user, what the risks are with every change that we implement on board. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, I handed that on well. <laughs> thanks, thanks, uh, for you. <laughs> that's okay. No, worries. so just to further build on that, you know, so that systems engineering and that engineering change process. So I think um, it's all recognised that it's a well trodden path and it's documented um, within the Australian Naval Publications, uh, the, the N4 Library, and then the appropriate management plans. So that the way that we assure that is making sure that our plans um, are adhere to those. Um, and then in addition, it's making sure that the key stakeholders are invested in those plans and those processes and those work instructions. So for those that are working as part of the, the ACPC, well, the LXD enterprise or the, the WAMA Alliance, we've got a point of reference. Uh, so it's going systematically uh, as engineers do. You know, so what are the requirements and then stepping through that process, having those design reviews uh, and teasing all those areas uh, before we, we start sort of implementing any engine change. No, um, for the next question, who signs off on quality documentation based on conformity of design plans? Is it the project manager, license engineer or the naval architect? 
So who signs off on them um, from our yeah. side? <laughs> okay, I can go through an example, if that's okay. Sometimes it's a little bit easier than that, and I'll use LHD and the ACPC as an example of where that sign off comes from. Um, so if we're doing a, an engineering change, let's use Navantia. Um, they're the, the in-country design authority for their systems. So we would um, champion that EC or that engineering change process. We would reach back in to the, the level two engineering uh, design uh, area. It's you know, currently located in Melbourne with full delegation from Navantia, Spain. We would then offer up that uh, engineering change uh, proposal. Um, and this is where we've got engineering authority and executive authority. Uh, so from an engineering side, it's uh, the principal engineer and then whoever's delegated as an executive authority to sign that off. Uh, and that happens to be within the, the Commonwealth. So we provide our, our recommendations. Uh, we'll have the technical uh, sign off, uh, but ultimately it'd be the, the principal engineer and the Commonwealth executive authority that uh, provide the final signatures. Next question. Does the Commonwealth obtain NSM's advice on the usage upkeep cycle for vessels that you manage? Also, something that is done in other enterprises, but does NSM utilize material ready days and material capable days as part of your KPIs? You want me to repeat the question? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think we're getting involved into sort of commercial sort of areas. Um, more than happy to, to speak to those. Um, so can we influence uh, the UUCs um, by recommendations, um, you know, particularly from an asset performance and optimization sort of area, uh, whether with uh, frigates and sort of capital ships, um, in particular with uh, the LHDs, uh, dock availability, noting that there's only one within, uh, I'll show you that's uh, capable, kind of drives that sort of drumbeat uh, on that side. Uh, probably a lot easier for patrol boats, um, you know, on that area, you know, so like the, the OPVs or, or PVs or CAPE or any of those, probably a little bit easier to, to recommend alternative UUCs uh, on that side. Um, for ANZAC, yeah, definitely, and for LHDs, um, those KPIs, um, as you already know, sort of days, uh, we can make recommendations, but uh, um, I think those recommendations need to be data driven um, with uh, the, the evidence. Um, to support it as well, so we can make informed decisions, yeah, or informed recommendations from the Commonwealth to make those uh, decisions. Mm. Uh, what is the main priority of NSM during a docking uh, docking period? What is the main? What sorry? The management hierarchy. Oh, the management hierarchy. Okay. Um, okay. So each program. Um, and the, the WAMA alliance is subtly uh, different than the LHD ACPC, so it's always hard, and, and neither would I compare them uh, like for like. Um, having recently gone through um, HMAS Canberra's docking, and, and Adelaide is currently in dock at the moment, um, NSM delivers through a program. Um, our program, uh, we have a, a program director, and then he has a leadership team, uh, whether that's the engineering manager, asset performance and optimization manager, uh, supply support, business performance. Um, so, and then underneath the maintenance manager, uh, we've got a, a, a docking manager. Okay. So they look across um, one of our sort of shared services, which is a project management office, and then we'll have a number of uh, production managers and assistant production managers, contract administrators, etc., that support the repair agents. Uh, so who's responsible? Responsible through the program, the program director, uh, he'll delegate that down through to the, the docking manager. Um, but just building on that, if I may, uh, we have got uh, integrated project teams. So I think probably about six months out, um, it's just making sure that we've incorporated lessons or identified issues from previous documents. So we try to design those out as opposed to not repeat. Um, getting stakeholder engagements, you know, what is the uh, um, required activities? Um, what are the risks? What are the issues? What are the opportunities? Uh, and what does success look like? Uh, so on a, a drum beat, whether that's um, monthly um, as 
but as we get um, a little bit closer fortnightly and then you know weekly um, sort of areas uh, and then if need be you know daily activities yep the next question do you have any key areas for improvement in defense and the defense industry enterprise practices over the next decade well i'll be a rich man if i can answer that one in full <laughs> um okay so <laughs> I think we've got, uh, so the challenge to the defence is um, and an opportunity. I think all challenges are, are opportunities, so let's uh, frame it from a, a positive spin. Is uh, we've got the future maritime sustainable model uh, being rolled out and the first sort of proof of concept of uh, that, that sort of strategy will be and is through the, the OPV uh, CLCM, so Capability Lifecycle uh, Manager on that side. So it's trying to understand as as industry how we work collaboratively and together, uh, noting that we might have a CLCM for one uh, particular asset class, and then we've got regional maintenance provider centres and regional maintenance providers um, located, whether that's the north, northeast, east, or, or west. So I think it's making sure that some of our maybe old assumptions um, are left at the door. Um, and embrace, uh, I suppose, where the, the Navy and the, the Commonwealth want to go in that direction, as opposed to, to fighting the white. And the next question. In the past, the managing contractor has been in dispute with ship staff over the root cause of defects. This has resulted in ship staff not uh, managing defects at sea in order to demonstrate that the defect was a direct result of previous maintenance activity. How is this avoided in this context? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so it's the burden of proof, isn't it? Um, okay. So we're going to go on uh, on data. All right. So in order, so if we're not recording it um, at the time of, of what the uh, the failure was, or, or you know, adding to that sort of root cause analysis, sort of downstream. Um, you know, it's hard then to sort of um, to do that, but we're not looking to sort of um, there's a no blame sort of culture. You know, that, that's what we've got to strive towards. Um, if the maintenance was done on time in full and um, when it was supposed to do uh, with the, the correct sort of materials and uh, the application, that's great. Uh, if it's not, OK, what can we do collectively to improve that? Now, some of the, the ships um, like LHD have got integrated platform management system and we can do trending and analysis and, and monitor a lot more sort of data points. Um, but then we're awash with data. Uh, you know, so how do we cleanse that data? And you've probably heard the, the terminology smart. How do we make you know, dumb data into, into smart data? And how do we sort of make informed decisions on that? Um, it, it's utilizing um, tools. Um, you know, whether that's through um, so whether it's through um, ILS or LSA or maintenance um, availability and, and models uh, to do so. Um, with ANZAC being slightly older platforms, you know, where as part of, um, I believe it was AMCAP, so the ANZAC, ANZAC Midlife Capability Assurance Program and at the PSR, we introduced a, a number of sort of different sensors and transducers to try uh, and understand uh, some of those sort of uh, key data points to assist in um, root cause analysis at Danestree. So whilst maintenance um, may or may not be being done in full, okay, that's great, um, but we can only make and recommend um, on evidence-based decisions. Um, so if it's not been collected, uh, let's start trending it, collecting it. Um, and then if we're not responsible for collecting it, let's speak to somebody that can um, and then articulate the benefits of why we should be doing it at the same time. Hmm. Yep. The, the next question, there's still a couple uh, to answer. Are you happy that we try to answer the last, last few? We'll call yeah, yeah, if, if everybody's still with it there, then that's great. Thank you very much for uh, sticking with it. Um, so maybe last couple of things I've said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, for future external maintenance activities for the ANZAC class of ships, um, including the scope of maintenance, defining the scope of maintenance and upgrades, at what point is the maintenance plan set? 
Uh, okay, so uh, we have maintenance work list, so three months out, and then it becomes different revisions of that. So um, looking to sort of lock those in uh, as early as possible. So at the three month point, we should know 95% uh, of, of what we're doing from a, uh, a planned uh, and planned corrective maintenance activities. Um, the, the areas that it might grow is when, as an example, it's inspection of tanks um as part of like the or as part of the uh, i suppose rolling uh, whole survey um, it might have areas there that come sort of un unpicked mm. yep. so does nsm have a dedicated team that continually reviews mttf mttr for shipboard equipment uh, continually um okay i I, on a limb and uh, um, without speaking to the asset management, asset performance optimization team, yes, we do. Um, in particular, when we're doing um, some of those system reviews um, and you know, in, in some of those other FIMUCAS um, uh, areas. Um, so, yes, um, uh, whilst you know, I suppose in the, the context of this question, um, review but are they right um in the first instance so just because a product comes with a mean time between failure or mean time uh, between repair is it validated in the environment that it's um working in so uh, as part of the, the acpc we're doing a logistics uh, support analysis uh, program uh, and working through a number of systems to, to drive those outcomes Um, and here's a question for uh, uh, for your personal opinion. What do you see as the biggest challenge for NSM engineering over the next five years with the standing up of the regional maintenance centers under playing Galileo? Okay. Uh, so is anybody doing a SWOT analysis, are they? Or um, click on the, the opposition. Uh, it's one of the, um, I suppose, from an engineering side, um, I don't think we've got too many to be honest with you. Um, you know, we're not the outcomes um, on that side, and neither we to uh, confess to, to do so. Um, we won't hold design authority, and neither will we on that side. So, our process is pretty um, transportable on that area. I think that the biggest challenge uh, with uh, the stakeholders, uh, enterprise, is divisions of responsibilities. You know, who's responsible for what uh, and making sure that there's effective handover points at each time. So if we look through a engineering process, um, maybe it's a, a problem identification report, you know, where does that originate? Um, who agrees with it? Who endorses it? Who provides the subject matter expertise? Who accepts that? Who then follows up and moves through? So from a, an alliance or an enterprise with a, a number of stakeholders, uh, making sure that we've got clear swim lanes and uh, processes that are mapped accordingly, um, but don't gather electronic dust or you know um, physical dust for that matter. So in short, uh, making sure that we've got clear responsibilities. Hmm. And um, I think I'll call this as the last question for tonight. Um, so what opportunities are there to adopt big data technologies to optimize asset management on aging platforms such as the ANZAC class? Um, opportunities, uh, lots. Um, so we've, we've got uh, Max Noble, who's our head of digital, uh, looking at that uh, at the moment, uh, working um, you know, in concert with uh, the Commonwealth uh, to, to, to use as uh, and I, I think it's the interrogation of the, the data um, for that. Uh, and then, you know, I think we're what, halfway through ANZAC sort of life. So Hunter class, um, whilst it's coming down the, the pipeline, um, it's still got a, a way to go on that area. Um, you know, and then we're only as good as the, the systems and the, the tools that we're, we're utilising uh, collectively. And so the opportunity um, is to make it a little bit more intelligent. Um, let, let the, the data drive some of those outcomes, you know, with a, a balance of performance and, and risk uh, overlaid on, on top of that. So opportunity, um, there's still a lot of the life left in ANZAC, 
um, and what we can be doing is making you know a, a lot more life cycle um, based decisions now uh, to safeguard us against the future. You know, let's try and avoid some of those short term decisions. And um, there was some also um, if the slides will be provided after the presentation. So if you would like a copy of the slides, would you be able to get in contact with Engineers Australia and we should be able to facilitate that. And um, with that, I would like to, on behalf of IMRS and Rena, I would like to thank Ian for giving us an insight into Naval Ship Sustainment.